Thanks for joining us. So I'm going to uh, go ahead and get us started uh, this afternoon and, and welcome you to our Preservation uh, North Carolina Shelter Series. My name is uh, Clarissa Goodlett and I'm the Communications Director at Preservation North Carolina. Um, during this time when sheltering has become a central part of our lives, we wanted to create a space to connect with you to explore the culture, architecture, diversity, and stories of the many buildings and houses that serve as shelters across our state. Um, we'll continue to add uh, shelter series events throughout 2021. Um, please visit our website at uh, preservationnc.org for updates on our next shelter series event. Um, this afternoon, we're uh, really delighted to present um, the shelter series to you free of charge, but we're always grateful for your continued support of our programming. Um, if you're enjoying this series, please consider a gift to help us keep it going. Um, we've provided a giving link in the survey that will appear at the end of the program, or you can again visit our website at preservationnorthcarolina.org. Um, um, so today we're excited to have with us um, Letty Shoemate, and she is going to be sharing with us um, the Green Book in Wilmington. So we'll explore some of Wilmington's over 50 Green Book locations. Letty is a historian, educator, facilitator, and podcast host in Wilmington, North Carolina. She is a host of her podcast, Sincerely Letty, where she educates about history and bridges the past to the present. She discusses race, discusses racial and social issues, and she doesn't hold back the truth. Her gift and ability to connect the dots is something that is critical to learning from the past. Letty received her MA in history in 2015, where she focused on American history and specialized in black history and race studies. She also completed her MA in conflict management and resolution in May of 2020, which equipped her with skills to incorporate effective communication with hard topics in her work as a historian and anti-racism educator. Letty is involved with projects in her local community and is a leading voice when it comes to racial justice and history education. She is co-chair of the New Hanover County Community Remembrance Project through the Equal Justice Initiative. Uh, she's a board member for both the Dream Center for Arts Education and the Bellamy Museum in Wilmington, North Carolina, and has been featured in articles, news stories, participate on the panels, and has been a speaker for different events in the community. So we're super excited and honored to have uh, Letty with us this afternoon. And also on the screen are our uh, director of the Bellamy Mansion Museum, Gareth Evans. And we have with us also from Bellamy, um, Leslie Randall Morton. So there are uh, folks joining us <laughs> from Wilmington. So um, I'm just gonna take a few seconds to do a quick little um, housekeeping about um, Zoom. So if this is your first time on Zoom or your first time with um, the shelter series, just wanted to talk to you briefly about how we uh, do our, our Q&A. And so let's see here, do this. Um, yeah, so we're in a webinar format um, this afternoon. So uh, as you can tell, everyone is muted and your visit video is disabled, except for our panelists and presenters. Um, we can't hear you, but we know that you're there. So thanks for coming. Uh, this session is being recorded. It's also being live streamed um, on our Facebook channel. And so uh, it'll be available to view later on our social media, on our website, YouTube, Facebook, um, and Vimeo channels. If you're having any kind of technical issues, please utilize the chat function and we'll do our best to assist you. Um, and so in terms of asking questions, I, I will moderate questions from attendees um, at the end of the, the presentation. Uh, we're also gonna probably take a break in the, mid, in the middle um, and Letty will uh, answer questions at that time too. In the meantime, um, you can utilize down at the bottom that Q&A button to type in your question 
And um, we'll read that question um, during the, the, the question part of the program, or you can utilize the chat. You can type it into the chat as well. And again, if you all would just take a few minutes at the end to um, complete a really quick survey that'll help us improve our shelter series, we're interested um, in your feedback. It's a quick survey. If you'll take a second to do that, the link will appear as soon as you exit um, the survey. So we certainly appreciate that. And with that, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Letty. Thank you, Clarissa. Um, hey, everyone. I obviously cannot see you, but I'm really excited to um, be here. I'm going to go ahead and jump right in and share my screen and hopefully have no technical issues. So let's see how this works out for me. Uh... Okay. Okay, I hope everyone can see my screen. Okay. Um, Clarissa, could you let me know if you can or cannot? We can see it, Letty. It looks good. Okay, okay cool. Okay, so as you know, <laughs> this lecture is all about the Negro Motorist Green Book, also known as the Green Book. Uh, there was a movie made about it a few years ago what is time anymore with COVID but uh I think it was maybe two or three years ago a movie came out about it uh which really I feel like made more people be much more interested in the green book I was interested in it even before that uh but I realized a couple of years ago whenever I spoke about the green book at the Bellamy Museum in October of 2019 so oh, a year almost a year and a half ago, uh, realized that the Green Book in Wilmington was not discussed and there wasn't actually a ton of research uh, that was about different locations specifically. So I was like, I'm gonna look into Wilmington just a little bit and just start to scratch the surface because as a historian, that's what we do is we dive deep into the research, but first we get our toes wet a little bit to figure out what hasn't been asked before. And so in doing research, I came to the realization that really the Green Book was necessary because of racism and white supremacy, which I already knew, but that's why I came up with the title Driving Without Privilege, because it was a privilege to be able um, to move about in this country freely. And often that privilege was for white people, which is the same white privilege that still exists today. And so to really talk about the Green Book in Wilmington, what we have to understand is historical context, because history matters, uh, factual history matters. And so to discuss the Green Book and Victor Hugo Green um, and travel guides and why this was even necessary in the first place, we have to go back to really slavery. And just a disclaimer, everyone, I'm going, I have my iPad set up here. So I'm going to be looking away from the screen a little bit so I can scroll on this. I just want you all to know that I'm not idly just looking away from you. So, okay, let's get started. Okay, so the institution of slavery was extremely pervasive in this country. And by extremely pervasive, I mean this country functioned on that. And it's 2021, and I don't just really changed with that. Uh, and so uh, slavery here in our country um, began in the 1600s, lasted through, legally lasted through 1865. Uh, you had the ratification of the 13th Amendment, um, and with the emancipation of enslaved people, here in the United States, uh, all of these legal initiatives were introduced. Like I just said, the, the um, 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, and then also the 15th Amendment. 
Um, they are all passed between 1865 and 1869 to basically solidify the equal rights of recently freed Black Americans. Now, these amendments granted freedom from slavery, the promise of citizenship, and also equal protection and the right to vote for Black men, right? Yeah, that's what they said they did. Uh, so then, though, to make things even a little bit better, uh, Congress decided to pass the Civil Rights Act of 1866. And the Civil Rights Act of 1866 declared all people who were born in, the, in this country, so the United States, as citizens. Then you also had the Enforcement Act of 1870, which basically said that voter, voter discrimination based on race was not legal. And then you had the Civil, the Civil Rights Act of 1875. Um, which granted Black Americans the same rights to facilities um, and privileges as white Americans. And so this era was also known as the Reconstruction Era. Okay, and it was, I actually go into this really heavily in my podcast that I have. Uh, so definitely check that out. It was a Jim Crow series that I did fall of 2019. And I really get into the hypocrisy actually of what I was just reading about because there were a lot of laws and things and acts that were passed. Uh, but <laughs> because things are passed, it does not mean that there are not still loopholes around them. And so despite the legal freedoms and rights that Black Americans had won, white people in America still remain resistant to their equal standing. And y'all, whenever I talk about history, I do not sugarcoat history. <laughs> I say it for what it is. And so if at any point also during this lecture, you start to feel uncomfortable as a white person, I urge you to sit through that and to <laughs> feel all of that because this is the this is the history of this country. And so, moving on. Uh, I should have said that at the beginning. <laughs> so, at the same time that you're having these acts passed, right? The things that I just read out, which make it seem like everything was hunky dory and rainbows and sunshine, you also have extreme white violence happening in this country every single day. So you had lynchings, you had beatings, you had assault, you had um, home bombings, you had all these, you had towns and cities that were uh, making their own rules and there was a lot happening. There was also the founding of the KKK uh, in 1866. Yes, uh, during that same time, these amendments were passed for freed Black Americans. And the KKK resorted to extreme violence and racism and terrorism, uh, domestic terrorism. So you also had at this time um, sharecropping and uh, Black people trying to make their way, uh, trying to live in a country that did not make any room for them at all. The freedom that Black people were promised was not looking like the freedom that they thought. And so you also started to have in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, you had flourishing Black communities. Uh, Wilmington, North Carolina was actually one of them, like one of the cities where Black people were flourishing, uh, especially in the 1880s and the 1890s until the 1898 race massacre, which happened here. And so all these things are happening, right? Still, white intolerance of racial integration on any level was apparent, um, especially whenever it came to Black people in the spaces with white people. And so the efforts of Black American leaders who um, basically aim to criminalize racial discrimination by private business owners and different court cases and things like that uh, were thwarted in 1883 when the Supreme Court found the Civil Rights Act of 1875 unconstitutional. Yes, the Civil Rights Act, the same one that I just read to you, which basically said that Black people had the right to not be discriminated against. And so after this ruling, many states um, started passing laws which allowed segregation in public spaces and also on railroads. The most notable case 
In this line of court decisions, reinforcing discrimination and segregation was Plessy versus Ferguson, um, which was in 1896. Basically in 1892, Homer Plessy was a white passing black American man. He was arrested after he boarded the whites only section of the East Louisiana Railway. And long story short, this, I mean, I just said it was 1892, whenever this happened, and the case reached the Supreme Court in 1896, so four years had passed. And basically, whenever it got to the Supreme Court, they argued that the Constitution could only enforce political and civil e equality, but not social equality. Hmm. And that segregation did not inherently mean racial inferiority. Don't you love those loopholes, right? And I quote, if one race be inferior, inferior to the other socially, the Constitution of the United States cannot put them upon the same plane. So with this decision, you started to have separate but equal. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard this before. Uh, no, that did not start with Brown versus Board of and in 1954, people think that, but it was really 1896 with Plessy v. Ferguson. And so you had legal attacks like this, right, that were uh, basically uh, toward Black Americans. And yeah, they were the law. Um, and so this also, though, coincided with the upward and social, like, economic mobility of Black Americans and this threatened the political supremacy of white people. Uh, so yeah, whenever you look at the history, you'll see whenever a lot of these cases, and I don't mean just this, these big cases like Plessy v. Ferguson. No, 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 no. I'm, I mean also the, the, the smaller hometown cases that the history books don't tell you about. Yeah, they went right along with the time that black people started to really exercise their freedom. And so the two pictures that I have here on the screen, the left one is from a newspaper. Um, actually, the newspaper was out of Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, the Jim Crow car law. And because the Jim Crow laws, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, um, were basically a series of anti-Black laws that were racist and rooted in white supremacy. And so as you see, it says, um, you have to be in separate cars. Uh, and so <laughs> there were actually, and I'm chuckling at this because of the, as, just the sheer absurdity of it. Um, but this was, this was America, like this right here that, that you're seeing. The picture on the right is not from North Carolina. I actually used to have this on my notes I'm looking at, and I actually don't have it here. I believe, though, that it was in Arkansas, if I'm not mistaken, and it's what the Jim Crow car looked like on the inside. And so, like I just said, Jim Crow laws were anti-Black laws. That's period. <laughs> um, and there's really, I mean, if, if you want to take time to look into what the Jim Crow laws were, you absolutely can. There were laws for every state. There were laws nationally. There were laws for cities and towns. And local governments could decide what they wanted their Jim Crow laws to be. They didn't even have to have them written. They can make them up at the drop of a hat. It didn't even matter. Uh, and so think about how much this upheld uh, white supremacy and racism. And so with this, though, you also have restrictions with space, travel, uh, things like that, right? Like public, like where Black people weren't able to go. And so Black freedom varied basically, yeah, with time and place, but always with the right move without hindrance um, was one of the most important features. So you... I, me as a Black person, I am sitting here living and breathing in this country that tells me I'm free and I want to do things too and have fun and whatnot, but there is this fear um, and this continuous threat of making, of like what could happen to me if I make the wrong move. Black Americans were met with discrimination and other acts in other aspects of travel as well, hotels, restaurants, gas stations, uh, there were thousands that were closed to Black Americans entirely. Some businesses um, only served Black Americans at certain locations or on certain days or hours. 
this is the stuff that I feel like often you might see it in a television show or like in a movie and you don't think that it's something that would happen in, oh, I don't know, little old Wilmington, North Carolina, right? But it, but it did because racism didn't make any exceptions. And so you also had these separate but equal laws, sometimes even posted in these establishments. Um, poor quality products were served to Black Americans in restaurants and, and things like that. And so, yeah, it was just pervasive racism. And the picture that you see on your screen is actually one that was taken in Durham, North Carolina. Uh, covered waiting room, you actually see the sign in the top left corner area. Um, private property, no, no parking. Uh, yeah. So by the 1920s, um, there was a rise in the recognition of Black Americans as a viable consumer base, specifically in larger cities. And so it's important to also note here, though, that the reason why this happened in 1920s is because of the Great Migration. So the Great Migration, basically from the early 1900s to really the late 1960s, if we're being real about this, um, was a huge exodus of Black Americans from the South moving to the West and to the North because they were fleeing the racial terror that was in the South. And the number actually in many books is like 1.5 million Black Americans fled, but uh, the more I read and the more I research, uh, there are a lot of Black people who were not on the census and things like that. So that number is a lot higher than 1.5 million. Um, historians are starting to actually see that. And so uh, after World War II, you had this golden age for travel. And this was also due to the expansion of the highway system, because without the highway and roads, what's the purpose of a car, okay? And also the rise of different services, like chain restaurants, motels, gas stations. And so you start to have this new idea of leisure and what leisure actually means. Now, it's also note that that racial terror that I was just talking about, right, that racial terror in, did not just, was, was not just the segregation and and the KKK, that's not the only racial terror I'm talking about. I'm also going to talk about race massacres and things that happen like here in Wilmington, in Georgia, in South Carolina. I mean, in many, many cities, right? And so I, I, I want you to keep thinking about that when we're talking about the Green Book and travel when I get to that point about the immense amount of trauma that Black people also experienced like their ancestors experienced, my ancestors experienced, and um, what that did to fuel this, uh, this want and this need to just be freely you, right? And you also had, during the same time, you had Black communities that were mobilizing, that were um, resisting, uh, that were forming their own clubs, their own groups, uh, national groups, organizations, like, there was a lot also happening in the Black community to figure out how to navigate this racism that wasn't going to go anywhere. It still hasn't gone anywhere. Um, but what that looked like to actually move about. And then the image on the screen is of a family that was traveling from Florida to New Jersey. And I want you to really look at this. So this is um, obviously a car. But you also see that there are six people in this picture. So that means all six people were in this car and they took what they could take with them. Uh, photos tell a lot. They're black and white, yes, and they're still, of course. But if you really take time to look at pictures, um, see what they're, they're saying to you. And uh, one of the things that I noticed after a little while looking at this picture a few years ago, was what this represented about um, Black wealth um, and also safety. So cars, which I'm going to talk about the car in just a second, but um, the Henry Ford's invention of the car 
actually was not something that uh, a lot of people, first of all, in this country had access to. The movies and stuff make you want to think that they did. That's really not true. Uh, often what it was, especially for Black families, was maybe one person in the entire family, even extended family, maybe had a car, right? Especially families that were in the South. Um, and, and, and things like that. And so I think about that whenever I look at this picture. So the automobile. So throughout the early 20th century, access to cars as well as car ownership um, continued to grow. So in 1908, Henry Ford had designed what we all know as the Model T. And it became extremely successful here in the United States. Um, by 1927, um, more than half of more wealthy American families owned cars. Now, yes, you had Black people who also owned cars um, in the North, uh, higher numbers than Black people in the South because of wealth distribution and all these different things and whatnot. That's a conversation for a whole different webinar. <laughs> um, but what you have to also understand is that by the like after World War II, this idea idea of what having a car represented was really implanted in Black people's minds. Like that's something that really signified wealth and also the freedom to go as you please and to do as you please and it represented status. Um, and it also represented autonomy. So there's this theme with talking about the Green Book regarding time and space, right? And also with time and space comes a conversation about bodily autonomy right, and what that meant for Black people. And I don't just mean bodily autonomy and things like that whenever it came to driving a car. What I mean is also bodily autonomy, um, which goes even back to slavery and the lack of bodily autonomy during slavery, okay? So you have to connect all of these dots to understand the bigger picture and why this was so important. Cars um, were a clear statement of physical freedom. Uh, it was um, both a commodity and symbol that affected the American economy, landscape, social structure, more than any other consumer product. Uh, <laughs> whenever you actually look at old magazines and, and things like that from this time, you'll see the number of car ads, right? Like the number of people who are laughing and joking that are beside a car or uh, just different car dealership ads and things like that. Often, of course, 99% of the time, they were white people who were in these magazines laughing and joking with like a car and things like that, but it just signified something bigger. It was a notion of freedom and freedom also meant no longer being oppressed. And no longer being oppressed also meant freedom, even for a little bit, from racism in this country and uh, making your own way how you want to as a black person. Not only did the car indicate physical escape from Jim Crow realities, but also the accessibility um, of a new social position for Black Americans, for those who could, who could afford to own a car, became um, this reaffirming symbol for not just for themselves personally, but also for, for their families. And these are just two images that I found. Um, the one on the left is Rex Billiard Hall for colored. Um, possibly on the other side of that may, may have said colored folks or maybe just said colored. Um, and then on the right, you have uh, two women who are laughing in front of their car and just like seeing the joy that it brings and just this, this idea of freedom. So in 1949, Ebony had published this article that was titled, Why Negroes Buy Cadillacs? And uh, it was basically talking about how the Cadillac represented um, wealth and status and all of these things. And so you started to see more car ads in Ebony, also in Jet Magazine, which came out in the 1950s. You started to see more of those. You started to see even more images of Black people who were having fun in different locations with their families, with their friends, like doing hobbies, like all of these things, right? Which exercised, like showing black people exercising freedom. And as you see on the left, um, there is an 
Ebony Magazine from 1951. And then uh, to the right are four women in front of a car. You also had at the time music and things like that in the 1950s about cars and everything like that. And just, yeah. So after a while, all of this propaganda, right, starts to form in your mind. You're like, wow, yeah, like having a car, it's great. And I just want, want y'all to know if Black people didn't have a car, it did not mean that Black people were not still moving about freely. There were still buses, there were still trains, there was things like that were still also going on. And that's also why the Green Book was extremely important, not just because of driving, right? Like, yes, of course, for driving was like the main thing with the marketing for the Green Book, but also people could get this book and have it with them if they were going to be on a train, right? Or on a bus, and they were going to get off in a city or a town. They would know where they were going to be safe. And so while having a car did offer some degree of freedom um, for many white people in America, the increase of car ownership uh, served to simply, number one, reinforce segregation, but also number two, for white people to get upset about black people having wealth. Now, I'm pointing this out on purpose because whenever I mentioned before the race massacres and reasons why many Black people were, were fleeing the South, these race massacres were also because of white people feeling threatened because of Black people and their wealth. Okay, and so we start to see these patterns throughout history that are still prevalent today. And while Black Americans were able to escape um, the basic um, dehumanizing of themselves, right? Like they were able to escape this from like white people. Um, white people were like, okay, what can we do to not have to like share the same even roads with black people? We don't even want to have to do that. So then you start to see laws and things created um, and rules, and I say rules, because there are things that could have just been made up if a cop decided to stop you late at night or um, a group of deputized white men um, to say that you couldn't be on a certain road and you couldn't drive on a certain back road or you weren't allowed to be there. And so we still have this, this idea, right, of time and space and, and, and what that means. And so you also have, sorry, I lost my spot. Here. Yeah, so then you also had um, places where Black people um, were able to stop, since we're talking about cars and gas and, and things like that. Um, and SO service station was one of those that was actually a gas station that was always welcoming, according to books about, um, I mean, sorry, always welcoming to Black people. Uh, and the two men that you see on your screen right now are men who were actually like the representatives of um, ESSO in New York. And uh, there was a ESSO service station here in Wilmington actually as well. And there's a photo I have of where it was, which I'll get to later on. And this is also an ESSO service station in New Jersey. And as you see, like there's a staff standing outside and things like that. I just thought it was really cool to see this picture. Um, and so this is also around the same time that you see a rise in these gas stations and in these standard oil companies. So the unknown of the open road. This is something that uh, Black people traveling had to always be aware of. Um, there were minor inconveniences you could have, like a flat tire or something like that, of course, or maybe a car issue. Um, but oftentimes there was also life-threatening violence, and you could be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And you started to see things called sundown towns. Now, sundown towns do not just have a sign that said, we are a sundown town. You are not allowed to, to stop here. No, that is not how all the sundown towns were. Also, 
There's a big misconception that most sundown towns were in the South. They absolutely were not. Most sundown towns, like the, uh, a much larger number of them, um, were in uh, northern cities and midwestern cities, actually. The South, right. The South, uh, there were places that many Black people knew to just not go. Um, in the South, you also would have law enforcement, um, sheriffs, uh, mayors, preachers, deacons, people like that, that were actually patrolling certain areas of certain towns and cities to make sure that no Black people came in there at certain times and things like that. Yes, there is record of that. That may come as a shock, but it doesn't come as a shock to me. Not in this country. Um, and so uh, what you see here on your screen, um, the very top image uh, says, don't let the sun set on you here, understand? And then you also see at the bottom, we want white tenants in our white community. Um, and then another one on the bottom right, that's basically a news um, clipping that's about black people being run out of a town. And in the far left, black men don't let sundown catch you in, and then it says saint, and I can't make out that last word. Um, and so you would have signs sometimes, and sometimes you just would not. And sundown towns, they were not just in certain states. They, uh, sundown town actually is not something that um, was in the Green Book. There was no warning for it or anything like that. But the Green Book did have in it safety precautions that you should take whenever traveling. And one of those safety precautions, um, actually, I think there were maybe 12 or 13 of them listed. One of them was to be very aware of your surroundings and where you are. And so I, in researching the Green Book, I can't help but think how that language meant so much more than what we think it means, right? It actually was like a black culture understanding of make sure you're not where you could get killed. And so, actually, I'm gonna go back for a second. And so, really, something else to understand um, whenever we're talking about sundown towns is the power, right, that white America had to decide when and where, what would happen to you, your family, your children, anyone. Um, the power that uh, white governments had um, and white America just had, just in general, to say where you were and we're not allowed to be. And a lot of times black people were killed. They were killed just for being in a place where white people didn't want them. Um, you have written accounts uh, where Black people witnessed uh, things happening to their families. They witnessed murders. Um, they witnessed uh, uh, people getting upset just because you had a nice car. And as a Black person, you weren't supposed to be uppity and all of these things, right? And so it's actually, it's the, the amount of pervasive racism in this country in, in, in history is, uh, it's really undeniable, even though many people still want to deny it. But that's why I enjoy talking about history like this, to reconnect those dots for you and to show you uh, um, that this is real, right? And so you also had Black people who would get put in jail. Um, Black people who would be just put in prison, Black people who uh, would have things planted in their car and accused of stealing something or whatever happened. And there are some firsthand accounts that really go into this. And um, one of them was by Irene Staple. Um, her and her parents drove down to Alabama. And she actually said that by, that by the time they got to Raleigh, North Carolina. They were traveling from New York. By the time they got from, by the time they got to Raleigh, North Carolina, there was a tension in the air, and uh, she was hysterical. They 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 were afraid. Um, there were no um, SO service stations that like they could find along their route, and so there's just a lot of that, um, a lot of stories like that. And so again, when we talk about freedom and we talk about um, moving about in spaces and in time, I want you to 
really understand this uh, because we talk about Wilmington, North Carolina, and we look at Wilmington today, and uh, there's a some vast amount of the history that's left out whenever it comes to what Black people have had to endure. And now, I'm not saying at all that all Black history is about struggle, because it absolutely is not. This whole Green Book lecture I'm doing is going to show you all about Black resilience and um, the ability and the power to constantly overcome by people being just innovative, uh, continuously wanting to provide for people uh, by having these Green Book lo locations. And these are just some images that I thought were very happy. There's a man and a woman on like the left in a car and then you have mobile gas in the bottom right um, and a little girl and uh, three people standing with her. And so, uh, yeah, just the joy. So, travel guides. Before we got the green book, there actually was um, Hackley and Harrison's Hotel and Apartment Guide. And you also had the um, Travel Guide. The one that's pictured on the left is from 1952, but these actually came out in the early 1930s. Matter of fact, the one, the Hackley and Harrison one that you see on the right uh, was in 1930, right? And so, you really started to see Black people starting to address these issues with traveling. As you see on the travel guide at the very bottom, it says vacation and recreation without humiliation. Yes, without humiliation and dehumanization, really. And so uh, you start to see these pop up and they also have places like hotels, gas stations, restaurants, beauty parlors, um, barber shops, uh, different entertainment areas that serve Black people. And so then these, uh, these allow Black people to be able to drive safely. It, it, it really was a relief kind of to, to have reassurance that, all right, I, I know where I can go to be safe. And whenever I think about the Green Book, I think about the Underground Railroad as well, because the Green Book really was kind of like an overground railroad, uh, which is interesting. Because uh, whenever a few years ago, well, actually, yeah, I would say about seven, eight years ago, uh, whenever I was really learning more about the Green Book, um, just in graduate school and, and things like that, I used to think that it was, oh, all of the Black-owned businesses in cities and towns are in the Green Book. Not true. Um, <laughs> they're not all there. And I found that out about Wilmington, which I'll get to. Anyway, so these are, again, two images of these two travel guides. And, of course, the one I'm talking about is the Negro Motor Screen Book. To the left is an image of Victor Hugo Green, who actually started the Green Book from his last name. And uh, Victor Hugo Green was actually a Postal Service employee. And he was born in New York City in 1892. And uh, by 1913, he was working for the United States Postal Service as a mail carrier. And he realized that there was this lack of resource list, or there was a lacking resource list, sorry, for Black people to know how to travel safely. And living in a city like New York, he realized, okay, I should do something about this. Like, I, I really think about people in history in very layman's terms, ways. And so... Uh, he, yeah, he started the Green Book in 1936. Some places will tell you 1937. Really, it was 1936. And he, his vision for this Green Book is really something that I commend to, to be honest with, with you. It was very, it was very ambitious and the way that he actually found out about Green Book locations and things like that were through the um, Postal Service, like nationally. There were people who would, would report back to him. Because really what happened in 1932, after he kept hearing, hearing about people complaining about traveling and things like that, especially his friends and family, uh, he was like, okay, we need to do something about this. 
Sorry, I lost my spot again, y'all. And so after the first issue of the Green Book, uh, they decided to really start to widen their scope and things like that. And that's whenever we start to see places like Wilmington, North Carolina, getting put, put in the Green Book. And I'm going to get into actually some of those in just a second. By 1940, 1945, uh, you start to see the guide really like grow exponentially. It was uh, predominantly 1950 to 1955 that you see the most locations in the most cities across the country. And um, there are 43 states by even 1940. Um, that were in the Green Book, as well as Washington, D.C. By 1949, the guide covered the United States, uh, Bermuda, Mexico, Canada. And you also started to see travel for international places like South America, the West Indies, Europe, and West Africa. This happened around 1955, 1956. The reason for that is because you started to see a rise in airlines and things like that, right? There are all of these other parts of history, and we're looking at this kind of stuff. You have to look at the bigger picture to really understand what else was happening in the country for this kind of thing to be required and to be necessary. And it also shows you a lot, right, about the freedoms that Black people were starting to even explore more. Right. And you also think about when this was happening. You know, talk about 19. 55, like 1960, this is really an integral time during the civil rights movement. Yeah, and often what happens when we're talking about history is these connect, these connected dots are left out. And so what you start to see too is more black empowerment and more, and even more resistance, right, against racism and against white supremacy and uh, continuing and Black people continuing to make space for themselves. And here on your screen, on the very left, you'll see the cover of a green book from 1940. The middle is 1947, and the right is 1956. There were more than 9,600 green book sites total, and 85% of them were Black owned. So where could you buy the green books? You could buy green books, black, black churches, SO service stations, um, certain newsstands. And you also, uh, what I found out recently, actually, where you also had black people who um, were selling them, not necessarily in a gas station or in a church or things like that, just black people who were just selling them. SO service station, in addition to selling the Green Books in their gas stations, would also advertise in the Green Books. That's something else that um, Victor Hugo Green figured out was how uh, to fund the Green Book by having people buy ads and things like that to put in it. So then you start to see the Green Book getting thicker over time and the page numbers increasing, not just because of the locations increasing and, and, and stops, but because of advertisements. And so Victor Hugo Green's initial purpose um, and really ultimate goal for this was, yes, for Black people's safety, but his ultimate goal was that the publication would eventually become obsolete and that um, it would no longer be needed. Uh, and actually, Victor Hugo Green died in 1960. And so he didn't even get to see like the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. He didn't even get to see that. And the Green Book stopped being published in 1967. But even after that, let me make something else clear, just because the Civil Rights Act of, of 1964 was passed does not mean that places decided they were going to just up and allow Black people to eat, sleep, 
uh, get gas there and those kinds of things. Okay, let's just clear that up because <laughs> there is this misconception with history that just because something is passed as a law or a policy means everyone's going to abide by it. Absolutely not, and especially not after the Voting Rights Act, or sorry, the um, Civil Rights Act. So you have Black people who still actually carry the Green Book around with them, um, like even older copies and, and, and things like that after 1967, just in case, just in case. Okay. Um, I'm actually going to pause for 15 minutes for any questions right now that people have. Yeah, we do have a couple questions. Yeah. Um, so I'll go ahead and cue those up. So um, the first one was from um, Linda Potts, and she wanted to know, were there Jim Crow laws in the North as well? Yes, Jim Crow laws were all across the country. It was not just the South. Um, actually, uh, they were the same. Um, in racism, Often what happens with history is because of how the South is portrayed as just the only racist part of the country, and people think that automatically northern cities, um, towns, and yeah, people think, oh, well, they were just not like that. They absolutely were like that, actually. Uh, oftentimes, whenever you even read about the civil rights movement, right? I mean, you, um, so many people want to talk about Dr. King. And they forget that uh, whenever Dr. King went up north, he was treated the same as he was treated in the South. And so that's just like one example I just thought of. But yes, there were Jim Crow laws across the entire country. Then we have a question from um, Karen Bell. Can you explain autonomy more? You use a term I didn't understand. I think she's talking about when you were talking about bodily autonomy. Yeah, so it just means ownership of what is allowed in your space. So uh, we see this during uh, the lack of it during slavery. So there was not an ownership Black people had amongst their own bodies, amongst, amongst their own space. Um, yeah, because of slavery, right, and the brutality of that and the dehumanization of that. And so then you also start to see a different idea of what autonomy is in a different in a different way, right? With like moving about freely whenever it came to traveling and what that meant, ownership of your space, ownership of where you could go freely and move freely and things like that. I hope that cleared that up for you. We have a question from um, Amy Jernigan. Um, what was the percentage of Green Book stops um, that were black owned? Yeah, so there were 85%, um, so, sorry, let me start over. 85% of Green Book locations were Black owned, um, which is interesting, which is interesting, um, kind of, uh, but there were still a lot more Black owned businesses during the time. They just weren't all listed in the Green Book. Um, and our next question is from um, Velva Jenkins, uh, was the Green Book profitable for Victor Green or only published out of necessity? Yeah, so he actually was able to profit a little bit more from it whenever ads started to be put in the Green Book. It's not that he didn't profit before, but he actually, when he first started it, was not really making money from it. It was really to help Black people survive. And that just goes to tell you how much is really happening in the country that he was able to do this. But he also had help from family members, um, a couple of them and some of his friends who helped him with printing and things, things like that. So that also helped him. Um, Louise Harrison wants to know where, where could you find one of these books? Um, so I was able to find all of the editions of the Green Book except for seven of them um, in an archive from the New York Public Library through the Schomburg Center. Uh, I'm actually going to be on the hunt for the others um, as well. But yeah, you can find them in a digital archive like that. 
Um, I had to search for a little bit for that to get it, but the New York Public Library and the Schoenberg Center are actually phenomenal resources. So if you want it to go, you can like, like not physically go, but go on, on online, you, you can flip through the actual green books and see all of the pages. Um, Blair Middleton asks, was there danger in even selling the green book? Um, i.e. did white people ever target companies listed in the green book? Yes, so there was danger in it, which is often why they were handed out and things like that in um, black spaces, so like black churches and things like that. The NAACP actually, like those different offices and like locations would um, have them. One thing that I'm, because my research for the Green Book is really right now, believe it or not, very surface level. Um, I have recently started digging deeper into it to figure out things about locations specifically in like Wilmington. And I have a few questions and one of them is, what was the white backlash to the Green Book specifically, like finding actual examples of that. Because as a historian and also not even just that, as a black person in this country, I have no doubt at all in my mind that uh, there was uh, some immense retaliation, which also leads me to think that the reason why some black owned businesses that existed that um, chose not to put their names in the Green Book maybe or vice versa. So these are just research questions that I have uh, to explore. So, yeah. All right. Um, got quite a few questions here. I'm going to go through maybe the last last few here, and then we can um, restart. But we've mm -hmm. got one from um, Allison uh, Deneen, and her question is: Was ESSO the only national chain that served African Americans? Um, is there any exploration of why ESSO made that decision? And so was not. There also was, even here in Wilmington, um, there were Shell oil stations. Um, and there were also, I have one, I have one written down. Um, Shell oil station. Okay, yeah, that's one I have written down. Uh, even here in Wilmington, that were actually um, operated uh, heavily by Black people. Uh, the one especially here in Wilmington was. And uh, as far as ESSO goes, it's the two men who owned ESSO or who were the representatives for it were black men. And so they were very intentional about why they chose um, to hire black people and to accommodate black people the most. Again, another research question that I have is um, really specifically about the ESSO service station here in Wilmington and who owned that. Because that kind of stuff requires that deep research because no one's really looked into that. Um, requires the deep deed research and the fun things that uh, make your eyes hurt a little bit. So I'm gonna be exploring that some more. Um, we've got one from Kenneth Foster. Um, wouldn't white owned businesses have an economic interest in being in the green book? And then secondary to that was, how did the green book earn a profit? Which I think you talked about a little bit, but um, so why wouldn't white white owned businesses um, want to be part of the green book when they have a economic interest in being in it? Um, because white people were racist and white people did not want to share their spaces with black people. And that's a very blunt way of telling or um, telling Kevin an answer, <laughs> Kevin, but uh, that's really the truth. And uh, something else, again, that I want to look at is why there were not more white people even in Wilmington and what the response was by white people in Wilmington, which will require me to look through old newspapers um, that were here. So, but yeah, really uh, foundational answer is um, racism. Um, let's see, Hector Sanchez Flores. Um, was or is there a green book publication for the current era, current era, a book that can connect consumers to businesses that are known to contribute to their community, especially businesses owned by people of color? Yeah, really good question. Actually, there was a lady, uh, maybe it was three or four years ago, um, 
or perhaps it was a little bit longer than that. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm getting that wrong. It was closer to 2014 because it was soon after the Black Lives Matter movement uh, really took off. And there's a lady who created a newer green book that listed um, some helpful tips for Black people whenever it came to traveling and how to stay safe as far as um, with police officers and things like that. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I know locally that there have been people, yes, there are Black people I know locally here in Wilmington who have actually started creating lists of Black-owned businesses and things like that. Um, to, and it's not even just for safety, it's for, uh, because black owned businesses actually get left out more often. And so it's really to, to raise awareness um, and not just to support local, to, but to support black people locally. Uh, so yeah, I've, I've seen some of that on like Facebook. I actually know a couple of people who were part of trying to do that year before last because really 2020 is a blur. Um, so yeah, but I would definitely like to see a modern day green book, um, but one that's more realistic, one that's really even stuff like Airbnbs that do not discriminate against black people and also people of color and, and just things like that. So yeah. Wait, I can't, I can't hear you, Clarissa. Oh, sorry. Some of these, I think you were able to dis to discuss already, but um, one is from Emily Silverman. How many green books are printed during its years of publication? Yeah, um, I'm going to get to all of that. Get to that. Exactly yeah, I think some of these probably, I think you were good. Somebody asked, are you going to name all the 50 yeah. green book sites and you will? Um, was there separate seating in airplanes from yes. Marsha Matt? Yes. Yes, there was separate seating. There were separate, there were planes, trains, um, buses that did not even allow black people on them. Uh, you had, uh, yes, there was separate everything. All right, I think the rest of these you'll probably either get to or we already mentioned. Okay. So, yeah. Cool. Perfect. This is actually really good timing. Going just how I planned. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Clarissa, for doing that. Appreciate it. I'm just trying to find my spot on my desktop here. Okay. Now we're going to get into the green book, specifically here in. Wilmington, North Carolina. So again, I was able to find all the editions of the Green Book, except um, I was not able to find 1942 to 1946. I was not able to find 1958 or 1965, but I'm going to. Oh, you don't worry. I'm going to find them. Uh, again, this is because whenever I first started doing this research, summer of 2019, I was really trying to find out all the locations and flipping through all of the editions I did find took quite a bit of time because uh, as a historian, there's a research methodology, like there's a way to do it or this way that I really do it as well, put my own little bloody twist on things. But in order to understand things about Wilmington, I had to also look at other cities and what they were doing and what they were listing out. Um, I had to look at if other cities had beauty parlors, barbershops, uh, taverns, hotels, motels. And also what else did other cities have that Wilmington never had listed, right? So that required going quite a bit. It's quite a bit to um, flip through, but I love doing this. I, I, I love digging into this. So there were 52 listed locations in Wilmington. Total, total from 1937 um, to 1967, there were 452. There were 326 locations total in North Carolina over the life of the Green Book. Okay, so most of the, um, sorry, the most locations in Wilmington 
were listed in 1949. This that you see on your screen is uh, our two obviously screenshot images from the Green Book from Wilmington in 1949. Okay, <laughs> that's a lot to say. So let me pull up something else here. The only location that was listed before 1947, and again, this could be incorrect, which I'm going to figure this out even more, because um, essentially, y'all, what I want to do with this is, you see all these locations that are listed here? Right. I want to figure out who owned them, um, like who, who owned the property before that person owned the property, uh, what happened to it right? Um, I want to find out if they were in local newspapers. I want to figure out if they were um, Black-owned businesses. And, and all of this requires, again, that deep research, like finding the deeds. And I don't know if any of you have ever done deed research before. It's fun. And I actually don't, don't really mind it, but it is often like trying to figure out a puzzle that you really don't have pieces, all the pieces too. Um, and so, but, but, that's, but that's the fun in it. And so before 1947, the only location uh, was Payne's Tourist Home and Tom's Taxi that I know of from what I have seen. Um, but what I also found is I was having to look in city directories and I recently started doing that and I happened to just click on two of them. I clicked on a city directory from 1942 for Wilmington, North Carolina, and I clicked on a city directory for 1943. Now, these city directories, y'all, uh, one of them was 1,068 pages and one of them was like 1,112 pages. So they're extensive and city directories were like phone books, right? Think, think about the like old, old phone book you used to carry around and I say that like it's a long time ago because it's not because I actually just recently used a phone book. So I'm not even trying to diss them or anything. I'm just saying that uh, I'm just trying to paint a picture for you, right, of what a city directory would have been like. And so I had to figure out how to figure out how to look at these city directories because everything's not just spelled out for you. All right, you, you have to figure out what, like how the directory is laid out, what abbreviations mean. Um, what the abbreviations for names mean, right? Like, you know, things, things like that. And so what I found actually, so Payne's, as you see on the very far left image, under hotels, um, sorry, on the very far left image, you'll see Payne's at 417 North 6th Street. And Payne's though was not listed in the 1942 city directory. It wasn't listed under hotels. Right. Because, you know, people would think, oh, well, you can just go look under hotels in the 1942 directory and it has it there. Wrong. Now what happened? Which is why I said there are a lot of the questions I have about the Green Book as to why certain ones were in the Green Book, but then they weren't listed in the city's directory. OK. Uh, interesting things it's like being an inspector gadget or something. So. I'm trying to pull up all my. All my things here. <clears throat> I'm going to pull up a document that I have with all of the Green Book locations and how many in what year. Okay. So in 1940, I'm sorry, in 1939, you saw Payne's Tourist Home listed in the Green Book. That's the only one you see in the great, sorry, Payne's and Tom's Taxi Cab. They're the only three that I have from 1939 to 1941. But then of course mine skipped 1947 because I don't have 1942 to 1946. In 1947, there are 36 Green Book locations in Wilmington. 1948, there are 43. In 1949, this one that you see here on like your screen, there were 50. 
And so I'm just going to, since I'm going through this right now, I'm just going to kind of go through here. The two hotels listed were Payne's Tourist Home. Um, as you see in the green book, it's listed as Payne's. I also found out uh, something else I'm doing is uh, getting oral histories from Black people who have lived in Wilmington, who remember not just the Green Book, but also have a plethora of knowledge about Black businesses in Wilmington. Because something else about Wilmington's history is we skip from 1898 and the Race Massacre to the Wilmington 10. And there is a huge chunk of Wilmington's history that is just left out. And that's another thing that led me to want to talk about and learn about and research the Green Book is to tell these stories because the Black community in Wilmington was flourishing. It was. like There were so many Black businesses. And I actually found out there were a lot more Black businesses than just what you see here. And so restaurants, you have um, Harris, uh, Johnson's, Hillcrest, Manhattan, Ollie's. If you look at the addresses, look at where they are, right? Payne's was on North 6th Street. Murphy's was on Castle Street. Um, you have Chestnut Street, Dawson, 13th, uh, Castle Street again, right? Beauty parlors, Beth's, Lazora, Germany's, Lou's. Um, you, you see all of these listed here. Um, and then at the top, you have Beauty Parlors continuing, um, Zan Zanzibar, um, Thilma's. And actually, what I saw while looking through the Green Books were variations in spelling. So like in the 1949 Green Book edition, you see Thilma's, which was really Thelma's, because in other editions, it's just Thelma's with one E. Barbershops. There were two Johnsons barbershops. Um, and again, look at the addresses here. Red Cross Street was uh, Beauty Parlor, Castle Street, Market Street. Um, Browns was on South 7th Street. Uh, nightclubs. So Hi Hat, Del, Del Morocco, right? And I'm finding too, though, that uh, when, when the postal postmen were reporting back to Victor Hugo Green, um, I'm also finding that they would put the locations in the category they think that they went in. Because whenever I was researching in a city directory, Hi-Hat, which is under nightclubs, I also found was Hi-Hat Grill, which was listed in the city directory under restaurants. So again, goes back to having to cross all my T's and dot all my I's when we're doing this stuff to just make sure things aren't listed somewhere else. And so then you have taverns. There's also high an, an, another high um, hat tavern. And so then you also have uh, service stations, Brooklyn. That was the SO service station. So here in the green book, it's just called Brooklyn. But you also see in other Green Book editions, it's Brooklyn SO service station. Garages, you have Fennels, you have different drugstores, um, Lanes, Ideal, Fair, Fair Price, again, Castle Street, right? I look at all of these, look at all of these businesses. Um, taxi cabs. Some of the taxi cabs too, as you'll see here on the bottom, um, were numbers that you had to dial. So you had Star, Max, Dixie, Tom's, um, and you also had um, a Taylor um, here. And so something else though about the Green Book is these were not buildings, okay, that would be an obvious beauty parlor or an obvious um, restaurant. Oftentimes they were people's homes people's houses. Uh, it was someone who did hair just in her home. It was someone who cut hair. And I can only imagine uh, like maybe a black woman doing hair in her kitchen or a man cutting um, hair in his living room or, or something like that. Because whenever I think about it, I think about how I grew up as a black person in this country in a black family, right? And just things that scream black culture to me. So there's also that bigger um, story that I want to tie into this. And that's where these oral histories come in. Let me go back to my other 
document here. Sorry, lots of things I'm trying to flip through here. So you also in the green book saw a substantial drop in locations in 1955 in Wilmington. You saw it go from 32 locations to three locations or three locations in 1955. Um, one of the restaurants, which is not listed here on this screen right now in the 1949 green book, one of the restaurants that was added in 1957 was a restaurant called um, Owen's Club. It's also listed in the green book in a later edition as Owen's Restaurant. So it's things like that that I wanna know, oh, okay, so why did that get added in 1957 and why was it not there before? Like, is this someone who moved here, right? Like, these are all questions that I'm going to be answering and digging into. And so you also had from 1961 to 1967, the only Green Book locations for Wilmington were Payne's Tourist Home, which is on this screen right here. Um, if you look at restaurants on the left, Johnson's Restaurant. And then again, I just mentioned Owen's Restaurant. Uh, those are the only ones listed from 1961 to 1967. So that's another bigger question I have is what happened in Wilmington during this time to cause the Green Book locations to um, not be as prevalent, right? And there are a few things I have about that. And someone that I recently talked to, I talked to two people who are um, local women, local Black women here in Wilmington, North Carolina, and um, very, very wonderful women. And I'm going to um, not say not say their names. Uh, I told them that I would not do that during this, which is just fine because I want to save that because again, this is not something I'm stopping after tonight. This is going to con continue going on, but I am going to share with you um, what they told me in just a minute. So the reason why I said I have some ideas about what happened in 1955 here and again, this is where y'all, that oral history becomes very, very important. And I'm also gonna look at newspapers and things like that to see what happened with the um, railroad especially. Because I do know that the passenger line here in Wilmington um, was no longer in existence after, let's see here, um, 19, in 1950s according to one woman who I talked to who has lived here her entire life. And it's because Piedmont Air was an airline that was getting popular and things like that. And also nationally, you had substantial changes happening with railroads in the mid fifties, um, in the early sixties. Also the um, Atlantic coastline uh, here in 1955, December of um, 1955, announced that the headquarters for the railroad was moving out of Wilmington and it was moving to Jacksonville, Florida. So that's something else I'm going to be looking into to figure out what that meant then for um, Black employment, what it meant for um, new or for mail being carried in and things like how, how did that affect the Green Book? All right, now let's look at some pictures. So I do want to say there was a Star News, a Wilmington Star News article that was published. It was either in 2018 or 2019, um, the spring of one of those years that listed about eight of the Green Book locations. And so a, a few of these pictures do come from that article. I do want to um, say that, uh, that they do come from that. These are two of them. So on the left, you have Payne's Tourist Home which was um, owned and run by Charles Payne. And to the right, you have the Murphy Hotel. And here's some information about Charles Payne. His full name was Charles Frederick Payne. Um, he went from 1879 to 1958. So he was born in Wilmington. He was the son of Louis Payne and Albina Davis Payne. Um, he married Anna Bell and they moved to Massachusetts where Charles was a fisherman on a government boat. 
Their son, Charles F. Payne Jr., was born while living there. They moved back to Wilmington, and in 1915, their daughter, Frances E., was born. Now, this is very important, and I'm going to come back to this because of something that uh, was shared with me in the 1949 city directory that listed Charles Payne. And so something else about Charles Payne, um, he was a porter at a department store on the 1920 census. Uh, he purchased this home, which became Payne's tourist home, at 417 North 6th Street in 1923. And he was always listed as the hotel manager. Um, Charles and Annie B's son was a cook at the tourist home, and he moved to Charlotte where he remained a cook. Um, and again, Charles Sr., um, who was the owner of this, uh, died in 1958. This is where the Brooklyn SO service station would have been. Again, this image is from the Star News article. And this is at the corner of Fourth and Taylor Streets. If anyone is here, which I'm sure people here are <laughs> from Wilmington, North Carolina, this may look very familiar to you. So this is near um, where, well, where I was often last summer during a lot of the protests and, and, and things like that. And um, it's a place I feel like where people just walk by it. And that's something else about history is there's so many places where people just walk by and they have no idea what happened there, right? And so I wanna look more into this SO service station because when I was talking to one of the Black Wilmingtonians about Black businesses, uh, she remembered two other gas stations. She did not remember the Brooklyn, um, service station. Now, it could be because she said that she was actually uh, born in different parts, a different part of the downtown Wilmington, downtown Wilmington area, the Black community, um, part of downtown Wilmington, but something else I want to look into. This would have been Dixie's Beauty Parlor. And the thing about Dixie beauty parlor, and I'm looking at a document that I have here. So it was listed as 512.5 Nixon Street. So 512 and a half Nixon Street. And so whenever I look at this building right here, I'm like, right. So if you see that door that's closest to the left, that white door, there's 512 above that. And so there's another white door to the other end. So that means two things were run out of this same building. Let's see, I'm trying to line this up with what I'm going through on two things right now. So this is on Castle Street, Bluebird Restaurant. I was trying to get a picture of it that day. This is a picture that um, I, I took, but if you look at this, to the left, like right in front of where this silver, right to the left of where this silver car is, there's a wooden door that is like boarded up, it looks like. But that would have been where Bluebird Restaurant was. I was walking down Castle Street and I kept saying that I was where I was supposed to be. And I was like, I'm not where I'm supposed to be, but I was. I turned around and it was right there. And so I had to walk across the street to get a really, a really good picture or a good picture of it, as good as I could get that day. Traffic was um, pretty heavy, and I actually on Castle Street for any day, and so I was not trying to get run over by a car for a picture. Um, <laughs> and then this other picture to the right is, fin well, would have been where Fennel's garage was, according to the Green Book location. Now, again, something that I'm going to have to do as I continue my research is to look up the actual deeds to make sure the property addresses are correct because something else that I found while doing research was that often what the Green Book would say was like 9th and Red Cross Street, right? But really in the city directory it's listed as 820 something something something, right? Which would make sense though if you're on the corner of 9th and Red Cross, maybe the building number was different 
right? And then also did things change over time, right? Like was this, did the way the city looks at um, different buildings and I, I number them, did that change over time? Right? You know, these, these are all questions that have to be answered. And then Germany's beauty parlor is here on the left, and then Howard's beauty parlor is on the right. Now, remember I said that there were um, just homes that would have been Green Book locations? Stark example here. And these two pictures are, again, from that Star News article. Germany's beauty parlor is listed as 715 Red Cross Street, which you see here. And then also Howard's beauty parlor was 121 South 13th Street. And this just shows you that Black people, they, they open up their homes to people who wanted to make sure that they were in a place that they were going to be safe, right? And that speaks highly about Black culture and the bigger picture of just Black community and Black unity for survival. And that's another story that I really want people to take in because we see it throughout history. And so it's important to also see it in stories like this that people might think are small, but they're really not that small, right? Like, what does this tell us about uh, the city of Wilmington during the time? What does this tell us about what, what else was happening in Wilmington at the time, right? Uh, and so also about looking into um, news articles and seeing about break-ins or if any vandalism happened and, and, and things, things like that. Johnson's Barbershop would have been to the right of the Black Cat Shop. So there's a man standing down here. This would have been um, Johnson's Barbershop. Again, been downtown Wilmington. Walk past the Black Cat Shop. <laughs> you've walked past this uh, building. You've walked past Killwins. Maybe you've gone to Killwins, but you, this is this is there. Max Taxi here on the left. This is a newer home, but this is the address for where Max Taxi would have been. What this tells me too is, though this home that you're seeing on the left uh, was not the home more than likely that was there at the time. What it shows me is that Max tax me or tells me was in a residential area, meaning that the person who was the owner or who was the driver of Max Taxi, uh, this was just their house. And then you have Star Taxi Cab, and this was on Chestnut Street. This is actually right across today from where Trucks Chicken is. If you haven't eaten that Trucks Chicken, you should, but a slight plug there, but it's across from where Truck's Chicken is, it's a strip mall that's there. And I found out that that strip mall also had other black owned businesses in it that were not in the green book though. And so whenever you look at Star Taxi, this is the North Side Food Market as you see from that white sign. Uh, whenever you look at it in the green book though, it just has dial 9259, meaning that someone who was at this building or what this used to be um, would be able to accommodate you. And another story too that intertwines with this because y'all all history connects, it just really does, it's fascinating. But something else was, um, you know, we have Uber today and Lyft and things like that, but these actually are newer as far as how we use them today, but they're actually not the first time people have thought about this, right? Um, black people actually were doing this far, like many, many, many years ago, like decades ago. Uh, black people were already coming up with ways to um, drive people to be safe, um, to be listed. And so that's something else we want to figure out about the Green Book in Wilmington. Ollie's Restaurant on the left here, and Gertrude's Beauty Parlor were the same home. And in talking to one of the Black women, what she told me was that often she remembers being little and the beauty parlors were in the back of the house because um, it's just how the houses were, were set up. It was like a separate entrance. This was a black person's house, but um, it's just how it was just set up. 
And so I was like, interesting. And I just picture for all these restaurants and Gertrude's beauty parlor, I just picture um, them just having, just cooking food and just welcoming people in. And uh, the, I can just imagine the like different conversations and things like that. And then to the right, you have Johnson's restaurant, which again was a residential area. And actually, I'm gonna go back, sorry, for just a second. So I'm gonna read to you, because I had Zoom sessions with both of the black women who have lived here in, in Wilmington most of their lives. And uh, it was really good talking to both of them for the first time, not the first time, because I actually know both of them, <laughs> but I mean, just talking to them for the first time as far as this research goes, uh, I didn't want to take up three or four hours of like their time. So I was like, or just 30 minutes to an hour, it's fine. So one of these women said one of her childhood beauticians was listed in the Green Book, uh, which she frequented because the shop was in the back of the house. And I quote, at that time, that's where your beauty parlors were, a room set to the back. We would walk up to the back and go in the back in the room at the back of the house was the shop. And so her beautician was Miss Germany, who ran to the left of this, Germany's beauty parlor. This picture again, that's on the left. How cool is that? And so she said, yeah, Miss, Miss Germany used to fix my hair when I was a little girl. She was a lot older. And so this lady also told me that another, she named another woman whose uncle's wife had a shop that was a beauty parlor. Um, someone named Miss Anita Adams. So that's a name that I jotted down to try to figure out and look into a deed with. And then someone else that she named who had uh, a shop on Nixon Street. And I was like, well, there are some green local locations I have on for Nixon Street that I don't have names for yet. So I jotted that name down. Um, sorry, I'm skipping ahead, but I just wanted to, to share that stuff with y'all. And then another woman who I talked to, the um, second lady, she gave me a lot of insight about black businesses in Wilmington in the fifties and sixties. And she was listing off all these, these black businesses. And I was like, I don't, none of those were in the green book, which made me question even more. Why weren't they in the green book? Right. And what made these other ones be in it? the fun of being a historian, y'all. It's great. And so she said Payne's Tourist Home was known as Payne's Hotel, not Payne's Tourist Home at the time amongst the Black community. She said Payne, the, the Payne Hotel was big for the Brooklyn area tourists. It was well known on the north side. People would come through on the railroad and would stay at Payne's. She said a lot of military people according to what her stepfather told her, who came through Wilmington in the 50s after World War II and after the Korean conflict, would stay at the Payne Hotel. And that's a direct quote from, from what she um, said. So then she also said that on the corner across from Payne's was a gas station named McClammy's Shell Station. I know someone asked me before, were, were there other gas stations? Yep. So there was one here in, um, called McClammy's. And then there was also... McQueen's Standard Oil on 3rd and Bladen Streets. And that was the gas station of former Sheriff Joe McQueen's father. And so these two gas stations though were not listed in the green book, but they were gas stations that black people went to, right? So yeah, raise some more questions. And this one woman who I talked to, um, her godfather actually ran Harris Barbershop, Harris's Barbershop, which was listed in the Green Book. And now, last thing I want to go over, this is pretty cool. So these are actually uh, screenshots, cropped photos I took <laughs> from the 1942 Wilmington City Directory. So I just kind of started I just picked a location or a um, green book yeah, spot. And I was like, I'm just going to see if I can find this one. So I started with McLeese's Beauty Parlor. And 
I was like, okay, let me just look though under the last name McLeese. Now again, y'all, this is a 1,068 page city directory. And so I'm trying to kind of guesstimate what page the M's would be on and scrolling down some more and guesstimating and scrolling some more and all this stuff, right? And then I get to McLeese and I find McLeese, Louise McLeese, as you see here on the screen. It's the second name right here. And to the right, it has hairdresser, because also in the city directory, in the very beginning, there was an entire page of just abbreviations, what things stood for, right, in the directory. So I had to kind of keep going back to that, and I bookmark that page, I keep, keep going back, and just jotting, and just jotting down some stuff so I would like, remember it. So what has her listed as a hairdresser, it has an address here of 820 Rankin, okay? But then it has an R beside 510 McRae. So an R beside anything would have meant resides at, like person lives there, which is interesting actually, because there's, I noticed some discrepancy with that sometimes in, in the city directory. And so this is also why oral histories are very important and doing that deeper research is critical, which is what I'll be doing. And so I was like, okay, is McLeese, is Louise McLeese, like is she the hairdresser? for McLeese's beauty parlor. So I kind of wrote that down in, in my document. These things can be very excited. Then you have beauty shops uh, here. These are from the 1942 directory. Um, on this though, all of these were not in the green book. The ones that were in the green book were Germany's beauty studio which is 715 Red Cross, which is the same one that was in the Green Book. Just in the Green Book, it's listed as only Germany's, but it's the same address. Howard's Beauty Salon. And in the Green Book, it's listed as Howard's, not as Howard's Beauty Salon. You also see Wazora's, Wazora, well, Wazora Beauty Shop. In the Green Book, it was listed as Wazora's. And then there's one down here that I'm going to have to look more into. It's called Vanity Parlor in the city directory. In the green book, there's one called Vanity Box. And the addresses are very similar. And so I'm like, I wonder if the green book had it in error listed a certain way or what. So again, the deed research comes in here. And now, Earlier I was reading about Charles Payne and I listed out Charles Payne's wife, his son, and his daughter, right? So someone shared with me the, um, the top image you see. You see the last name Payne. This is how the city directories used to look. You see how it says C-H-A-S-F? So Chaz, that's an abbreviation for Charles in a city directory. So that was Charles F, Charles F. Payne. And then Anna B, his wife, tourist home, 417 North 6th Street. The H there would have meant the person, like the householder. That's actually what it has in the, um, on the abbreviation page. You also see here Charles F. Jr., who was the cook, which also was in the um, biography I just read to you about Charles Payne. And then you see down here, Fanny, I'm sorry, Francis E., who also is listed as 417 North 6th Street, who was his daughter. Right, the things that you put together with history. And so then another thing I was doing is there's a Green Book location called Newkirk's. It is a beauty parlor. So I just chose that one. So I looked under the last name Newkirk in the city directory, and I was scrolling through and scrolling through. And I just happened to look out with this one. Like, this was truly luck. And I was going down, and on this, on this bottom image, the second line, you see EDW. EDW stood for Edward in a city directory. Then it says, driver, Max Taxi. And I was like, no way. I just lucked out with this. And I look at the green book address, and it says for Max, all it has is dial 7645. And so I was like, okay, 
there had to, had to just been one max taxi. So I figured out Edward Newkirk must have been the driver for max taxi, which is one of the images that I just showed you. That was pure luck that I found that that uh, quickly. And so now what I'm going to have to do is the is figure out the address for max taxi. I'm going to have to see finding the deed for that and seeing who the actual owner was. Letty, we yep. have to wrap up a little bit soon. We're about at the hour and a half mark, and we've got some more yeah. questions. This is actually the um, last. Uh, okay. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and then the last one is ideal place. So this is actually really cool because there were three drugstores or pharmacies listed from Wilmington, North Carolina. And ideals was one of them. It's listed in the green book as just ideals. Now, in the city directory, it's listed as ideal place. And the bigger black and white image that um, you see here is from something that was called the Negro Business and Professional Directory, which I found out about from one of the women who I talked to. I had never heard of this before. It was a black magazine that was published in the lower Cape Fear region and happened that one of the scanned images that she that she had pages was for ideal pharmacy it's the it's the ad for it in the negro business and professional directory and it has the owner's name um a eugene brown and so yeah that was a really cool connection and it was the only um black drugstore at the time. And at the time of this, um, this page that, that like you're seeing, that's, that's the uh, scan copy. This was in 1946. And so you have the other drugstores that appeared in the green book. Um, you had 1950 and 1948. So I'm about to see uh, if the other two were black owned or if they were not. So yeah. Um, we, we can go to questions um, now, Clarissa. Thanks, Letty. This is yeah. the, the comments and are excellent. Um, people have really enjoyed that. And so I'm going to do, we'll just do a couple um, questions here as we're closing um, up. But um, one is from uh, Catherine Carford. Um, this was very informative. You mentioned that there were sundown towns in northern and Midwestern cities across the United States. Um, do you have any examples of those towns and cities um, and other places? Yes, so uh, I do have a document actually somewhere in here, which I'm not gonna take time to scroll through right now. But I do have a document that lists out several, not even several, more than several of the sundown locations. Uh, there were a lot in Nebraska, Ohio, Pennsylvania, those are three that come to mind like right now. Um, there were quite a few also, uh, is it Delaware? I'm just trying to remember. There is one book that's been written about sundown towns by, it's by James Cohen and it's called Sundown Towns. I actually have it back here on my shelf of books. Uh, it's pretty thick, but um, I started kind of going through it and it's unreal how many that there were. And sundown towns here, uh, there's a map for a directory that I found that you can figure out which towns were sundown towns and a way to tell is also by census records and seeing how many black people were run out of a town and when and connecting those dots and lining it with history. Whoops, I'm dropping stuff, but yeah. Um, uh, this is from an anonymous person. Um, how much knowledge do you think the white community had about the existence of the Green Book would have been um, more secret within the Black community, ally community, similar to the Underground Railroad? Um, that's a really good question. And there's, uh, there's actually a book that I have that I recently got by Candace e. Taylor, and it's called The um, Underground Railroad, but it's about the Green Book. 
And so I'm going to go through that to see, because there's no need to reinvent the wheel. I'm going to go through that and see like what research she has and what sources she has, you know, like her footnotes and, and things and the notes sections of the books people, most people ignore that we historians run to and see what uh, she said about that. But I'm also curious because I want to see if it's another one of those things where it's like, oh, but there were white people who didn't want this to be happening and they helped and all this stuff. But it's like, history and numbers don't lie, right? And so um, that's a good question that I, I need to look more into, so yeah. Um, let's see, can you speak to how um, um, Black people and um, people of color are experiencing similar um, discrimination today, so uh, specifically related to travel? I know the outdoor and RV travel industry um, black people are still experiencing similar challenges. Yes, I absolutely can speak to that because I've experienced that. Uh, there are Airbnbs that won't allow black people or other people of color to rent. And often what happens though, it's, it's, um, it's that subtle and covert racism that isn't blatant, right? So people think that if that, un unless it's blatantly said, then it's not racism. Like that's absolutely a thousand percent not true if we really look at the laws that have been written for this country. And so you think about things where there are certain um, people who come back and say, oh, well, I wasn't able to, to get a room at this Airbnb or I wasn't able to rent this apartment. Then their friend goes and rents it and their friend is white. That happened to me in Wilmington at two apartment complexes, yeah. And it's like, this, this isn't a lie, this isn't false, this is like lived experiences, right? And so you also have it though, where it's black people who get stopped by, getting stopped by police officers. This is a real issue in this country and what happens whenever you get stopped. I mean, I'm doing this lecture today and a year ago today, Ahmaud Arbery was murdered. Um, and so when we think about safety, right? And spaces and, and autonomy and freedom, right? F freedom to jog, freedom to jog. Right, so it's, uh, yeah, there are absolutely, this, this country is still, is still, it has not progressed as much as uh, white America often wants to think that it has. I'm not saying that we have not progressed, it's not what I'm saying, but there's a, there are, there are categories for, for progression. Absolutely. Um, let's see, I, I don't know, Blood, did you, did you mention this, somebody asked about what does the C mean behind mean after some of the names shown in the city directory, this little C oh, parenthesis. Yes, um, it's one of the many abbreviations that I saw. I'm so sorry. It's, I have like 25 abbreviations written down and the C though often came with someone who is married. So like for like Charles Payne, you saw like the C with like Anna B, but then I also wonder because you see it too with people who are not married and the C is just there. So I'm wondering C has something to do with Leslie, yes, do, do it means know? color. It oh, for color. oh, okay, 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 thank you. Because I was trying to scroll through my document, I was like, I don't want to have to scroll through 50 pages of stuff. Yeah, that's um, how you could differentiate the white, white, women right, white people. And, and, and I was thinking that with certain people who I know were white back then from records and things, and I would be like, that's so, yeah, it's it, it's just really also trying to make sure that the consistencies with things in these old primary sources well, are consistent, right? So, yeah. Thanks, Leslie. Yeah, at one point in time, it was an asterisk, and then they went to the parent parenthetical C up, probably, I think, in maybe the late 40s or 50s. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you jumped on, Leslie. Um, I wanted to um, mention, too, like, Leslie's, some of Leslie's research, and that you worked with, um, with another book um, that you were using um, as a reference. It's Strength. What is the book Leslie strength, um, strength through struggle strength through struggle yes mm -hmm. I don't know if you Beverly, could... yeah Beverly Tedderton's work yeah with Bill Reeves I actually have uh the Bellamy's copy right here beside me nice <laughs> um let's see and I have um this will be my last question um Letty and you said it again, but somebody asked again which which years were you missing um, green books from I know you said I think like 1942 through 46 yeah. and they were curious if that 
those years were missing because of World War II or just? Yeah, um, 1942 to 1946, and then 1958 and 1965. Um, those are just not, I, I couldn't find them in the New York Public Library's digital archive. Doesn't mean that they don't exist. Uh, I just need to search and find them. Um, having the, the idea about World War II is possible with uh, funds and money and all that. 58 and 65, curious about. And so I'm wondering if, yeah, I might have to find them. I will, uh, will find them. <laughs> You're on a mission. Oh, I um, am, yes. I, this has been fabulous. One other thing I wanted to add you, we were talking a bit about um, you know, why or why not in certain, you know, locations appearing in the Green Book sometimes and sometimes not in one year. I did want to mention um, Preservation North Carolina is working with a property um, in Beaufort called the um, Godet Hotel that was a, um, was like two blocks from the um, Beaufort uh, 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 historic um, district and it's a really incredible um, property and has the kind of same history um, that we've been discussing in terms of um, you know black folks having a safe place to stay and travel there um, and kind of that um, cultural touch point in that area so you can learn more about that specific location um, on the PNC website it's called the um, Godet Hotel um, but I want to thank Letty. This has been incredible. Um, you had a huge crowd, so we thank yeah. you. You, could, you couldn't tell, but <laughs> we had um, a big... And, and Mike, what, okay, can I just touch on one yeah. thing very really quick? Because I totally forgot to mention this because it's something that I have found to be very frustrating about Wilmington's history. Um, someone asked if Seabreeze ever came up oh, in yeah. the and it did not. It did not. And Seabreeze was a flourishing, like, Black resort. Yeah, in, like, Wilmington, like, that whole area. And it was not in the Green Book. But just because it wasn't in, like, the Green Book doesn't mean that it wasn't important. But, yeah, I'm actually glad I was just scrolling through and I saw that a person asked that. And I meant to mention it. I mentioned it at my lecture the last time. So thank you for um, uh, mentioning that, um, Ms. Freeman. Uh, so, yeah, uh, something that I want to look into, though, and see, uh, again, why places weren't even in it, what the decisions were and stuff. So I'm just yeah, so happy that we're here. comes <laughs> up a bit when we've done programs about Wilmington. Yeah, it comes up yeah. quite a bit, um, mm -hmm. questions about it. So I'm glad you're going to be on the case. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Happen. This is going to be like a continuation. And um, I mean, this is just the beginning because uh, I just really want people to not even just know, yes, know about Wilmington's history and how rich it was, because it wasn't just 1898. It wasn't just that, right? And you have Black families who are still here, who are descendants of people from that horrific massacre, but there are also people whose families built uh, here, right? And like built new found, like, like just new foundations here. And I want people to connect this to the bigger history of this country so that when we have these conversations today about racism and white supremacy, this didn't just start. It didn't just start five out years of nowhere. ago. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It came out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. um, well, again, thank you, Letty. I wanted to let folks know, please take the, the survey that's going to pop up um, as soon as you exit out of the webinar. Um, look forward to seeing some of you again at another shelter series we'll be doing um next month and this program is being recorded it will be available on our website it's being streamed on facebook live right now so it'll be available on our on our facebook page immediately so um that's where you can find it all right thanks everybody bye bye, -bye.